Thank you for tuning in. You're watching The Daily Report for Thursday, January 6th here in Korea. Global interest in Korean dramas, music and movies has been fueling greater interest in its language as well. We have details later on the program. Here first is the global pandemic update with our Kwon Soa. So just start us off then. Sunny, daily COVID-19 infection numbers are definitely looking better than weeks ago. And we're also seeing a drop from the day before to 4,126 tallied as of 12 a.m. this Thursday. And that includes a little less than 4,000 domestic transmissions, uh, but close to 200 imported cases. And uh, almost 70 of those were detected at the nation's airport or seaports. Now, meanwhile, as uh, most places of the country are seeing a decline, there's also been uh, an increase in Gyeonggi-do province, for instance, which reported the highest number of cases, uh, also more than the capital's whole this Thursday. And uh, we are seeing a drop uh, by around 300 cases from the day before. And the better news is, even compared to last Thursday, it is an on-week decline by around 900 cases. Uh, but Korea is continuing to report double-digit figures of fatalities. 49 people lost their lives in the past day, raising the death toll to 5,887. Uh, but uh, the number of patients that are in severe or critical condition that has been going down again and now it stands at 882 as of this Thursday and it's the first time in 24 days that this number has dropped to the 800s. On uh, Wednesday, we've got uh, more than 20,500 people who got their first COVID-19 dose and uh, more than 74,700 who got their second shot, while there's been over 320,800 people who got their additional uh, shot or booster dose. So with that, 38.3% of the nation's population have received their extra shot. Let's move over to the international figures. We are seeing exponential rises in daily infections. In the past 24 hours, as of noon Korea time, more than 2.6 million infections were recorded, and that due to the spread of the Omicron variant. However, if we compare the figure to the fatalities, this number has not going up as much as we're seeing the increase in infections. Now, nevertheless, uh, although the Omicron variant has uh, set to have lighter symptoms than others, strains. Uh, these uh, rises in cases are still serious uh, in many countries as daily record highs have been uh, posted, for instance, in the UK, France, Turkey, as well as the Netherlands here. And those are the general updates for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sonny? All right, so I thank you for the global tallies over the past 24 hours. Now, for more coverage of the local COVID-19 situation, Choi min -jong is here in the studio. min -jong, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. Right then, let's start with the latest government response to the ruling against vaccine pass requirements at private academic venues, min -jong. Right, Sunny, the government immediately appealed the court's decision to suspend vaccine pass mandates at places of learning. The government on Wednesday reiterated that vaccine passes are necessary to contain the outbreak and resume our journey back to normal life. Authorities also highlighted the need to protect the unvaccinated who are more likely to become severely ill from COVID-19 and ease the strain on Korea's healthcare system. The government also explained that vaccine passes are a better alternative than tougher social distancing measures that could lead to many social and economic disruptions. However, many people in the private education sector were happy with the suspension of vaccine pass requirements at places of learning. Let's take a listen. Students were very anxious when the vaccine pass mandate was suddenly announced. They're also worried about vaccine side effects, which could affect their ability to take the exams. If my friends are not vaccinated, there's no place for us to prepare for job interviews. If the vaccine pass mandate is suspended, anyone will be able to use study cafes. But I'm also worried about the risk of infection. Many students and those in the academic arena have welcomed the court's decision for the most part, but this could also set off a chain reaction with many restaurant and cafe owners saying vaccine pass requirements should be lifted at their venues as well. Right, I see. And against this backlash, uh, Minjong authorities are also reportedly, that is, exploring the possibility of offering vaccine pass exemptions to certain people. Tell us more about this. 
Right. The government is reviewing plans to expand the list of people that are eligible for vaccine pass exemptions. This comes as officials have been criticized for adopting vaccine passes at essential businesses like supermarkets, especially by those unable or unwilling to get vaccinated due to pregnancy or underlying health conditions. Authorities added that they will consider making improvements to the current system together with experts in order to sort out any confusion surrounding vaccine pass requirements and exemptions. However, officials did stress once again that vaccine passes will remain a key pillar of the government's strategy to curb any future outbreaks. Right, and staying with the government strategy, Min Jung I here, we have secured additional COVID-19 antiviral pills from Pfizer. Right, um, Korea has signed a deal with Pfizer to purchase 400,000 additional courses of its oral drug Paxlovid. Last month, the country signed a pre-purchase contract with Pfizer and MSD to buy enough oral medication for around 600,000 patients. And with this latest contract, the country has now secured enough pills to cover over 1 million people. South Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety authorized the emergency use of Paxlovid last month for use on home treatment patients starting mid-January. One final question, Minja. What's the latest with regard to financial support for those businesses hard hit by COVID-19? Well, the country has started distributing its second round of relief funds to struggling small business owners. More than 2.4 million people are eligible to receive 1 million won each, which is equal to around 830 US dollars. And last month, the country distributed the same amount to businesses that saw a decrease decrease in the sales due to strengthened social distancing measures. Owners of multiple businesses were not eligible the first time around, but they are now, and those in the travel, lodging and grooming industries have also been added to the list of recipients. And they will be notified tr through text messages, and payments can be processed on the same day of their applications if they're submitted before 6 p.m. I see. All right, Min Jung, as always, thank you very much for the report on the latest here on the local front. Thank you. Right, on the international arena, authorities are seeking to better adapt their COVID-19 strategies in response to soaring case loads amid limited medical capacity. I have Soa back at the desk with details on that. So let's start over in the US, where authorities have granted the green light, of course, to booster shots for those aged 12 to 15. Right, uh, as Min Jung predicted yesterday, the US CDC has now given the green light for uh, kids aged 12 to 15 to receive Pfizer booster shots to get kids back to school with more protection. Now, the CDC had earlier recommended additional doses for 16 to 17 year old teenagers in December, with this further lowering of the age limit coming just weeks later. And this as the Omicron variant has not only led to a surge in overall cases in the US uh, that just hit a million daily infections earlier this week, but has also led to an increase in hospitalizations among children. A seven day average shows that as of Wednesday, around 3,800 kids infected with COVID-19 were treated at hospitals, which is up 64% from the past week. Meanwhile, doctors in the US are voicing their opposition towards the CDC's other recommendation to shorten the quarantine period from 10 to five days for asymptomatic coronavirus patients, which does not require a negative test result to end their isolation. The American Medical Association said the new guidance was confusing, raises the risk of infection and could overwhelm the medical system. Right, and speaking of the burden on the medical system, uh, so uh, over in France, I understand doctors have been asked to return to work despite testing positive for COVID-19. Yes, Sonia, uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, appears to be the reality as the French healthcare system is barely coping uh, with the rampant spread of the Omicron variant. France reported an all-time high of over 330,000 new COVID-19 infections on a Wednesday local time, surpassing the 300,000 threshold for the first time. This has led to staff shortages and resulted in a special exemption to France's quarantine rules. Healthcare workers who contracted the virus but of light or no symptoms are being allowed to continue treating patients without going into self-isolation. 
The nation's health ministry gave this instruction on Sunday with the measure being rolled out this week. Medical staff won't be forced though and uh, officials stressed this is exceptional and temporary. Right, of course. Meanwhile, over in the UK, so regardless of the raging daily caseloads there, COVID-19 travel protocols have been eased. Tell us more. Right, uh, the rules on COVID-19 testings uh, will be eased starting on Friday 4 a.m. for people traveling to the UK. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced on Wednesday local time that fully vaccinated travelers won't be subject to pre-departure tests, claiming the measure is no longer significant in containing the, the, containing the spread of the already dominant Omicron variant, whereas the travel industry has been hit too hard. Currently, all fully vaccinated travelers over the age of 12 are required to submit a negative lateral flow or PCR test two days before arriving in the UK. Starting Friday, they will only have to be tested on arrival. Here are more details. We will also be lifting the requirement to self-isolate on arrival until receipt of a negative PCR, returning instead to the system we had in October last year, where those arriving in England will need to take a lateral flow test no later than the end of day two. Now, also uh, Germany earlier this week changed its travel restrictions, including the lifting of isolation uh, mandates on uh, for UK citizens. So this seems to be uh, the trend in countries where the Omicron variant has already become the dominant strain. And uh, in fact, uh, the uh, British Prime Minister also mentioned, warned that COVID-19 is spreading at the fastest rate ever. So this uh, easing of this uh, travel restriction is not because uh, the country is not seeing uh, the grave situation because because of the Omicron variant, but uh, these travel measures do not seem to work anymore in, uh, you know, containing this, this specific variant. I see. Finally, so what is the latest with regard to the spread of Omicron elsewhere then? Well, there are record figures uh, lately being posted in a number of countries in Canada, Sweden, and also, although not a record high, in India, uh, the number of cases doubled uh, from the past four days. And uh, there are also uh, talks that in India, the third wave has set in, and also Japan is seeing increases uh, where there are also uh, talks about a sixth wave uh, starting, although the daily increases are not as bad as in other countries. Meanwhile, Argentina uh, reported over 95,000 infections in a day on Wednesday with 52 fatalities, uh, but uh, notice that the uh, number is uh, lower than um, compared, to, uh, compared to the caseload. The number of fatalities is in the double digits, uh, and uh, that also seems to hint that the Omicron variant uh, has become the dominant uh, strain there as well. So let's take a listen to an expert's assessment on the situation. More than 80% of what's in circulation is Omicron, which explains the enormous infection curve. Just today, we have 90,000 confirmed cases with positivity rates over 50%. That means we don't have 90,000 cases. Today in Argentina, we could easily be at around 150 to 200,000 new infections every day. Now, putting this into perspective, a positivity rate above 5% already uh, has been earlier mentioned by the World Health Organization to be a concern. So 50%, over 50% positivity rate uh, is a grave uh, situation there. And speculations are, however, uh, that there is a chance that the infections might drop by mid-January. But uh, this, of course, just uh, speculation. Speculation, I see. All right, so as always, thank you very much for the update, and I'll see you on Friday. See you. Topping our headlines, North Korea's state-run media has confirmed the country's test launch of a missile into the East Sea that took place earlier Wednesday morning. PNG has our first story. North Korea said it has successfully conducted a test launch of what it claims to be a hypersonic missile. This comes three months after it showcased a weapon system. The North's leader Kim Jong-un did not attend the firing. The regime state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Thursday that the missile it test fired a day earlier detached from its rocket booster and maneuvered 120 kilometers laterally before it precisely hit a target 700 kilometers away. 
Hypersonic missiles are seen as a game changer as they fly at a speed of at least five times the speed of sound, or more than 6,000 kilometers per hour. This gives little time for a defensive response, as the missiles can reach targets anywhere in the world within an hour. Unlike ballistic missiles that gain altitude before returning on steep trajectories, hypersonic weapons travel at lower altitudes. The state media added that the test also confirmed the stability of the fuel ampule system to operate during the winter. This suggests that Wednesday's missile was also fueled by ampule, just like the one the regime test launched last September. Regarding the launch, South Korea said it is under close cooperation with the U.S. to verify details regarding the missile. South Korea and the U.S. are currently conducting studies on the missile North Korea launched yesterday. The military reportedly said that based on the research it has done so far, what the North reported on the missile on Thursday does not seem to be all true. Pei eun Arirang News. And international response to Pyongyang's latest display of defiance has been swift. Washington and Tokyo have condemned it, with the former joining Beijing in calls for talks. Yi Shihu explains. The United States has condemned Pyongyang's latest missile launch, calling it a violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions as well as a threat to the international community. These remarks coming shortly after North Korea on Wednesday fired a missile into the East Sea, according to South Korea's Ministry of Defense and the Pentagon. A spokesperson at the U.S. State Department said Washington is consulting closely with its allies and partners in the region. Stressing the U.S. remains committed to a diplomatic approach to the North, the spokesperson called on the regime to engage in dialogue. The U.S. State Department also issued a statement saying that Secretary of State Tony Blinken denounced the North's recent launch during a phone conversation with Japan's foreign minister. It said Blinken reiterated Washington's will to keep America's promise to protect its allies, and the two sides discussed joint efforts to tackle the latest threat and ways to bring everlasting peace to the Korean Peninsula. Japan's prime minister also condemned the North, saying the regime's missile tests pose a grave threat. We find it truly regrettable that North Korea has continued to fire missiles from last year. The government wants to strengthen its vigilance and surveillance more than ever. We are now conducting a detailed and urgent analysis. And also responding to the launch, China pressed for the resumption of talks. Under the current situation, all parties concerned should keep in mind the big picture, be cautious with their words and actions, adhere to the right direction of dialogue and consultation, and work together to advance the political settlement on the peninsula issue. Beijing emphasized that exchanges and cooperation between countries would promote mutual understanding and trust rather than targeting or undermining the interests of third parties. However, citing experts, the AP said the North's launch, the first of its kind since October, signals it's not interested in rejoining denuclearization talks anytime soon. Rather, they say it shows the regime is focused on pushing ahead with its military buildup. Ishihu, Arirang News. On a light note, over in Las Vegas, following its earlier press event, the 2022 Consumer Electronics Show is now officially open. And this time around, our Om ji shares with us some of the scenes there. The Consumer Electronics Show has returned to Sin City. CES 2022 invites visitors in person for the first time in two years. Even spiking COVID-19 cases can't stop tech fans from attending one of the world's hottest and most influential annual tech events. For safety, several precautionary measures are being implemented. All attendees are required to provide proof of COVID-19 vaccination and they're required to wear masks at all times. With Omicron exacerbating the surge in COVID-19 infections, digital health is one of the major topics at this year's event. Medical device maker Avid has distributed free self-test kits to attendees at CES 2022. Their COVID-19 antigen self-test kit is easy to use and provides the result in just 15 minutes. Another huge area to look out for at CES this year is mobility, where an intriguing category in space technology has been added. 
Sierra Space stands out with its Dream Chaser, a space utility vehicle designed to serve various missions in space, including transporting crew and cargo to low Earth orbit like the International Space Station. AI and robotics is also one of the significant tech topics at CES 2022, and South Korean firms were at the center of it. South Korean firm Hancom Office presented their latest technology at CES 2022 and won a Smart City Innovation Award for HiCheck, a remote water reading service. It utilizes AIoT and AI deep learning technology where the system monitors water meter gauges in a more energy efficient and convenient way. CES 2022 will run until Friday with more than 2,100 tech companies from various industries vying for attention. Om ji Arirang News, Las Vegas. Right, and staying overseas, voter registration for the March 9th presidential election remains relatively low, with pundits pointing to the overall decline in interest in local politics as reason for this reality. Our Lee kyung reports. The registration period for overseas and absentee voters is coming to a close, but participation so far isn't as high as seen before. As of Thursday, around 185,000 voters had signed up, roughly 7.4% of the total eligible voters. At this pace, the final registration rate is likely to fall short of the 2017 election when 294,000 voters registered, or 14% of those eligible. It is almost a certainty for the U.S., which so far is seeing just 50 percent of 2017's registration level. The low participation rate comes as recent data shows the total number of South Koreans living abroad has dropped by nearly 7 percent from the end of 2018 to the end of 2020, during which COVID-19 broke out. In terms of students, there was a staggering 41 percent decrease. However, in general, there was only a minor drop and had no impact on the overall number of South Koreans overseas. In fact, there are more eligible voters this time than in the previous election by roughly 30,000. On top of that, the registration period is longer this time. It's been open since early 2020, so for nearly two years. But in the 2017 election, it was open for a little over one year, as the election was pushed ahead of schedule due to the impeachment of the president at the time. Observers point to a lack of interest in local politics and the inconvenience of actually voting due to insufficient access to polling stations and no mail-in ballot system available. But the National Election Commission says registration isn't over, encouraging last-minute sign-ups. Even if work is busy and it's inconvenient for some to go to polling stations that are too far away, we ask you to participate to exercise your rights. It's an election prepared by many people despite COVID-19. Eligible voters can register until this Saturday. Young Eun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Korea is cracking down on the use of disposable plastics as part of broader efforts to reduce waste and protect the environment. Our Min Sukyun has details. Single-use plastic cups will be banned from cafes starting this April. The Environment Ministry has announced a set of laws to limit the use of plastic and other disposable items. Under the revised rules, coffee shops cannot use plastic cups, plates or cutlery from April 1st. And from November 24th, paper cups and plastic straws will be banned at restaurants and cafeterias. Convenience stores and bakeries will also no longer be able to give customers plastic bags. Stores that violate the measure could face fines of up to 2,500 US dollars. The ministry says the measures are aimed at reducing soaring waste amid the pandemic. In 2020, the amount of plastic waste dropped 19 percent, while paper surged 25 percent. Expanded polystyrene, such as styrofoam, increased 14 percent, and plastic wrapping and plastic bags climbed 9 percent. The Environment Ministry called on the public and relevant industries for their support to reduce disposable items.
The government had initially prohibited the use of plastics in August 2018, but temporarily granted its use in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. This has allowed cafes and restaurants to use disposable items in line with the government's efforts to prevent virus transmissions. But now with vaccine rollouts, the ministry has decided to prohibit single-use plastics again to reduce waste. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. Starting this week, our check of the regional events that made international headlines will be brought to you every Thursdays. Now, as always, I have Kim sung -yeon here in the studio. sung -yeon, welcome back. Great to see you on a Thursday, Sunny. So uh, this week, as you can imagine, there's been quite a bit of international coverage regarding North Korea. And then on the economic front, Bloomberg wrote about uh, Korea's recovery from the pandemic. And lastly, a story about an anti-feminist movement that's been gaining traction here in the country. So let's dive right in. Just days after South Korean President Moon Jae-in vowed to make a final push for peace with the North Korean regime, the North's official KCNA Thursday said North Korea test-fired a hypersonic missile that successfully hit its target Wednesday morning. Regarding the matter, the Washington Post highlighted that in his New Year's address Monday, the president, President Moon Jae-in promised to use his remaining two months in office to seek a diplomatic breakthrough with the North, but at the other end of the spectrum, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un pledged to bolster his military in his speech on New Year's Eve. In the meantime, Reuters and the New York Times noted that the North fired the ballistic missile just hours before President Moon attended a groundbreaking ceremony for a rail line that he hopes will connect the two Koreas. The reports further emphasize that this is the first launch since fall that underscores Kim's New Year's vow, which in turn challenges Moon's efforts to restart dialogue. Nevertheless, Reuters mentioned that according to analysts, Kim's latest intentions do not necessarily indicate that he has completely closed the door on diplomacy. But the New York Times made note that the North's recent tests uh, surely indicate that the North has been developing more sophisticated ways of delivering nuclear and other warheads. Right, and staying with North Korea-related stories, Song Yeon, I believe a defector recently made his way back across the border. Tell us about that. Right, Sunny. So on New Year's Day, it was a person crossed the border from South Korea to North Korea, and it does turn out that he is likely a defector who had come through the same heavily fortified border from the other direction to settle in South Korea in late 2020. So the Associated Press reported that according to Korea's defense ministry, it is a Expected that it was an earlier North Korean defector who crossed the border back to North Korea on New Year's Day. The former North Korean citizen was captured south of the border in November of 2020, who had identified himself as a former gymnast and told investigators at the time that he had crawled over barbed wire fences to defect to the south. Although South Korea has asked North Korea at this time to ensure the person's safety, the North has yet to elaborate on the defector, hence his fate is unknown known. Other foreign media reports, including AP, noted that the double defector worked as a cleaner and struggled financially in South Korea, prompting him to make the dangerous journey back to the north after a hard time making ends meet. AP also pointed out that only about 30 defectors have gone back to North Korea in the past 10 years, with observers su suggesting the returnees probably failed to adjust to life in South Korea in most of these cases. Uh, the report also noted that defecting via the border is rare as most defectors come through China. I see. Meanwhile, on the economic front, amid the pandemic, Song Yan, I understand Omicron has been cited as a major challenge against market recovery here in the country. That's right, Sunny. So this is according to BOK Governor Lee Ju Yar, uh, who said that Omicron is posing the biggest threat to the Korean economy and its recovery, among a range of other risk factors. So Bloomberg indicated that this signals caution ahead of a policy meeting on January 14th, also pointing out that the governor's comments highlight the challenges 
the BOK faces as it mulls over when to raise interest rates again. The report, meanwhile, emphasized that the BOK is ahead of its peers in Asia when it comes to policy. It mentioned that the Korean government has continued to support the economy, providing the central bank with more room to scale back policy support without disturbing its recovery momentum. Now, Governor Yi also mentioned on Tuesday that financial firms should focus on managing risks as credit risks could rise among households and small businesses in the course of rate normalization. I see. Finally, Sang Yan, one final question then. Of course, this is something you mentioned earlier. The mm. anti-feminist movement here in the country that was covered by the New York Times, was it? Right. The Times, actually, uh, it's about how Korea is witnessing sort of a type of political correctness lately, Sunny. Um, this is at the cost of men who say feminists, uh, feminists are depriving them of opportunities. So the New York Times said an anti-feminist movement is growing here in Korea, finding a vast audience both on and offline, with wider social and political implications. The Times interviewed the head of Man on Solidarity, one of the country's largest anti-feminist groups, who told them that the feminists are a social evil promoting hatred against men. But the Times suggested that this sort of backlash against feminism is bewildering as Korea still has a high gender wage gap and uh, fewer than one-fifth of the country's lawmakers are actually women. Now, uh, nevertheless, the report highlighted that many young Korean men are fewer feeling threatened and marginalized in Korean society. It added that this is being fueled by a perception among young men that they are paying the price for gender discrimination perpetrated against women by older Korean men in the past, in the past generations. I see. All right, Sung-in, as always, thank you very much for that. I'll see you back next week. Yes, next Thursday. Thank you. K-pop, K-drama, K-movie. Korean contents have raised global interest in all things Korean, including its language. For more on this trend, I have Professor Lee Gyu Tak from George Mason University, Korea. Welcome to the program, Professor Lee. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. I also have Professor Krista Chem Sai Tong from Hanyang University. It is a pleasure to have you here, Professor Chem Sai Tong. Thank you for inviting me. Right. Meanwhile, joining this session virtually is Professor Jay Sung at the University of Melbourne in Australia. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Sung. Thanks for having me, Sunny. Right, we'll start here in the studio then. Professor E, do you believe the popularity of Korea's cultural contents is fueling global interest in its language as well? Yeah, actually, I have been teaching in my, my Korean courses, which is about K-pop, Korean culture, Hallyu, and Korean contemporary society in an American university located in Songdo. And actually, many American students who have decided to study in the university is a big fan of like K-pop, Hallyu, the K-dramas, and others. And when they enjoy all those Korean content, they also came to have interest in learning Korean language, Korean history, and other Korean culture, rather than Korean pop culture and Korean contemporary I mean, society. So, yes, that is the very I mean, big thing for them to learn all those Korean language, to understand more about what they love as K-pop, Korean culture, how you think. And yes, this is the very I mean, interesting situation that we are uh, witnessing. Right, it is really interesting. And Professor Song, I hear many Australian universities are now offering Korean language courses. Do tell us a bit about this trend. And do you suppose the popularity of Korean contents like Squid Game perhaps is behind it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, over the past five to 10 years, the number of students taking Korean language classes have increased dramatically. And now all the major universities in Australia are offering Korean language, culture, history, and politics subjects at an undergraduate level. Uh, 
Uh, for example, at the University of Melbourne, where I'm based at the moment, when I joined the university in 2017, there was no so a subject on Korea at all. But I see there was a huge student demand for learning Korean language, as you said, uh, thanks to uh, K-pop and K-drama, K-food, K-fashion and esports amongst young people across different nationalities and ethnicities. Uh, so especially in Melbourne, Blackpink is a big thing, as Rose and Jenny, the two members of the group, are from this part of the world. And Rose has a lovely Aussie accent, of course. And so we opened our first Korean language class, Korean 1, in 2019. And the number of students uh, was uh, close to 500 and overtaking Chinese 1. So we are all very overwhelmed by the massive uh, student interest in Korean language classes. And it's the same everywhere, not just in Australia, but in North and Latin America, Europe and especially Southeast Asia, we see the same trend that uh, is K-pop leading other K-content industry, uh, but also Korean studies overseas as well. Uh, starting with the Korean language at the beginner's level in big numbers, the so quantity really matters. So what we really need to look at now is the quality. So in other words, whether these uh, young students who initially started their interest in K-pop and language can move actually up to our upper levels of Korean language and deeper understanding of Korea, including its history, politics and society. So it is happening, which is good news, but it is not happening at the same speed as K-pop. Right. Now, Professor Song just mentioned Blackpink. One of the members, Lisa, I believe, Professor Chan Sai Tong, is from Thailand, right? Yes. Now, you've been living here in Korea for about a decade and you've since become a naturalized citizen. Could you tell us a bit about your personal journey and interest in the country? Sure. So, I became interested in Korean and set out to study it since the get go from the time I came to Korea. And first of all, by training and by nature, I am a linguist and I always have a lifelong interest in language studies and Korean provides interesting examples and counterexamples of linguistic phenomena that I have never seen in other languages that I know. And the second motivation is more on the transactional and functional side. Uh, with no knowledge of the local language, I found myself relying on other people's assistance uh, to get things done in the most mundane way. For example, ordering things on the internet. But with some degree of proficiency, I now am able to do it on my own and have autonomy in what I want to accomplish and have accomplished for me. And in addition to that, uh, there is a social motivation to studying Korean as well. So I I also want to socialize with people. I also want to tell jokes and connect with people. So in this regard, Korean serves as a social lubricant that smooths out social interaction and fosters interpersonal relations. So because of these motivations, I voluntarily enrolled in Korean language classes at the institution where I currently work. And uh, upon the first year of my arrival, and it's a daily five-hour class, and with classmates from all over the world, all of whom uh, were mostly younger than me and there are six levels all together and each level takes about two months and a half with exams and also classroom activities. I progressed through level five which translated to operational command of the language and the ability to handle some uh, unfamiliar aspects of life like politics, economics and society and culture. So even though my formal education for the formal side has ended, now my learning experience still continues by being immersed in the Korean culture. Oh, I see. Did you first become interested in Korean culture owing to its, uh, for example, movies or music? Uh, yes, a uh, certain part of it, but um, th that was a long time ago in the 90s, uh, the late 90s, when, you know, Daejeonggum, for example, was a big hit in Asia. Right, Daejeonggum. Professor Chen Sai Tong, how do you compare the global interest in the Korean language uh, now to perhaps 10 years ago? Sure, uh, there's, uh, that's an interesting question and at the same time difficult to answer precisely. The global interest certainly um, can be measured uh, using many different parameters. Uh, to name but a few, one indicator is the number of King Sejong Institute, uh, which is the language center operated by the South Korean government. Uh, when the network was launched in 2017, there were only 13 centers in three countries. But by 2019, there were 172 centers in, 36, in 56 countries, I'm sorry. And in 2020, the network expanded even further with 213 institutes in 76 countries, and the number is expected to go up in 2020. 
2021 and 22. Another indicator is the number of students taking formal Korean classes around the world. At the university level, uh, Korean uptake in American universities uh, was on the rise by about 15% between 2015 and 17, while overall environment in other uh, enrollment in other languages was in decline. And globally, there were almost more than 1,500 universities in over 100 countries offering Korean classes as of 2017. So there's a huge decrease in comparison to the late 90s when there were only 152 universities in 32 countries. And at the elementary and secondary school levels, we also uh, see the same phenomenon, uh, a rise, a huge rise in the students um, studying in Korean, taking Korean classes, and in Thailand, we have the highest number of secondary school students taking Korean class in comparison to the rest of the world. And another indicator yet is the number of those taking state-run tests of proficiency in Korean topic. And in 2019, the number of test takers went up to almost 400,000, and that's an all-time high, indicating growth in the number of committed learners uh, of the Korean language. So and the all, facts and yes. statistics also show that there is a growing interest in the countries in, in the Korean language. Yes, surely it does. And the spread of Korean is not only to be taken lightly, especially considering the fact that it has occurred within the span of only two decades. I see. Quite impressive there then. Professor E, do you suppose Korea's cultural contents have served to perhaps uh, raise, boost awareness of Korea on the international arena? Yes, of course. Actually, if you are Korean and if you have been in any other countries outside Korea and you will be asked by uh, the foreigners that do you know K-pop? Do you know like other girl groups or girl band or the name of like, uh, like BTS, TWICE, Blackpink and others? And maybe you do not know much about them, but still they are wondering that you, they, they, they will believe that you should know them, right? And they will ask about some Korean TV series or Korean TV shows and others. It means that they come to know about Korea, especially South Korea, uh, uh, by like enjoying Korean pop culture, mostly K-pop and other Korean dramas and Korean films. An interesting thing I can see is that although South Korea has achieved some like very rapid and significant economic achievement like since the 1970 till the early and mid 1990, and now you know that Korea is one of the like top 10 uh, ranking country among the very, I mean, rank of the economic, like, uh, the, the, the economic development. But interesting thing is that they do not know much about Korean culture, including history. They only know about, like, South Korea and North Korea, their conflict or some political issues or some others, rather than other things. But now many, like, global audience come to know, like, Korea other than all those political issues by enjoying those Korean cultures, which is a very great thing for like branding Korean names overseas. Right, it's image as well then. Right. Professor Song, what would you say are the broader implications of Korean becoming a more commonly understood language? Well, I'm not it was surprised by the significant increase in the number of topic uh, takers. Uh, uh, we should not consider this as a big success of a uh, government-led soft power. I see this more of a driven by South Korea's growing economy power, as Professor Lee just mentioned, uh, and its uh, growing influence in the world economy. Uh, South Korea is now the world's 10th uh, largest economy. Uh, learning Korean and is becoming uh, increasingly more important for businesses and trades. And um, at the same time, Korean le language learning and teaching create jobs. So it also adds on to those sort of economic benefits of learning Korean language and teaching as well. Uh, a more than a decade ago, an academic uh, called Janice Diali Matthews that soft power without hard power is not a power. And Joseph Nye himself uh, has amended the term to smart power. So soft power alone, the K-pop and the, the content industry is itself, it cannot make all these progresses in numeric terms. So it also connected to other material and hard power base supporting this sort of soft image and identity of South Korea. Right. Professor Song, you mentioned soft power. Do you suppose the soft power or the smart power that you said uh, generated by Korea's cultural contents perhaps allows the country to punch above its weight on the international arena? 
Oh, I think at the beginning, uh, the sort of South Korean government led the Ministry of Culture has a huge role in promoting Korean uh, cultural product and the content industry and overseas. But I think it's beyond that stage now where, you know, all the, the private uh, actors and these young people, I think the youth power is really a significant factor and playing an important role in spreading, uh, you know, the various and diverse images and identities uh, uh, different parts of cultures uh, of Korea uh, at the moment. So it's not, uh, it's better when it's driven by the, the people themselves rather than driven by the government initiatives. Right. And staying with that, Professor Chan Sai Tong, what are the implications of this global interest in Korean for Korea as a country? So um, for Korea as a country, um, f first of all, uh, we know that um, you know, um, the relationship between language and culture, right? That um, the effects of the global spread of Korean and the awareness of Korea on the global scale. So certainly one affects the other. So I can offer one powerful uh, piece of evidence. And most recently in uh, 2021, 26 words uh, were formally accepted into the Oxford English Dictionary, which is held as a definitive record of the English language. And it is unprecedented that this many words are added from one language within a year. So we have new food related entries such as bulgogi, uh, thin slices of beef or pork, or jimek, Korean style chicken and beer. Other culturally specific words are also added. Uh, for example, hanbok, the formal attire, the traditional attire. Most surprising to me are the words like uh, skinship, which captures the emotional and physical contact between two people, ekkyo, a kind of um, cuteness or charm characteristically Korean, and finally Finally, Tebak, for example, uh, f uh, fantastic or amazing. So, of course, the word Hallyu is also included. So, the inclusion of these widely used Korean words uh, testify to the fact that some aspects of Korean culture, at least, have spread beyond the borders into the, the global mainstream, and the fact that these cultural aspects have become part of the mainstream global culture. Right. Well, one of my favorite words there is mukbang. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> Professor, how can Korea's, Korean content that is serve to make most of their leverage, perhaps, to keep or to offer greater access to the Korean language itself? Um, when I think about my like my days when I try to learn other languages such as English or even Japanese, the thing that I did is to watch. Uh, US TV series or listen to Japanese pop music or watch Japanese films and it was a very great opportunity for me to know not the very I mean the grammars or uh, all the like sentences or the expressions that only uh, will be used very officially but in those like cultural content I could learn all those everyday expressions that many people in the United States or in Japan actually use in their everyday life right and when you use when you enjoy K-pop or Korean TV series or other Korean cultural content, it is, I, I believe that it will provide a great opportunity for those who try to learn Korean culture and Korean language by enjoying all Korean like TV series or Korean films or K-pop. And know that the TV series will uh, give all those like the great examples that how all those languages is actually used among people living in Korea, right? So I think it is very, I mean, great things for uh, people who learn, who try to learn Korean language, then they enjoy Korean culture, then they will get a great opportunity to learn all those Korean language more, uh, faster and easier. Right, and speaking about learning, Professor Chem Sai Tong, as a scholar who has studied both English and Korean, what can you share with us about your experience in learning these two very different languages? Okay, certainly there are differences in my learning experiences. Uh, some of, however, some of these are more or less uh, unplanned and opportunities making a head-to-head -head comparison uh, challenging. Uh, for example, I started learning English uh, as a, at a relatively young age while I am an adult Korean learner. So the quantity and quality of the input available to me as a learner is not on a par with my previous experience. Um, in terms of language acquisition, the younger one is the less effort, time, or commitment it takes to acquire a language. And um, in addition, I have spent 30 plus years studying and researching the English language 
while I have been exposed to Korea for about 10 years or so. So there's a big gap and a huge difference there. Um, but on the positive side, my prior education and acquisition of other languages may have positive effects on learning Korean. Uh, throughout the years, I have accumulated a great deal of meta language, that is, uh, those terms that are used to talk about language itself, like the passive voice, verbs, adjectives, and that kind of thing. So that linguistic awareness uh, facilitates my Korean learning to a great extent. Right. Professor Song, how does access to the Korean language compare to that of the Chinese and Japanese languages? And, and perhaps what efforts do you uh, advise to maintain this global interest in Korean? Yeah, I know it's just amazing. The students sometimes approach me asking about what uh, uh, the meaning of Chong, Han, or Nunchi, right? So that should be also included in the next version of the Oxford Dictionary, perhaps. Uh, where Korean language at the beginner's level is already overtaking Chinese. Uh, in Australia, and uh, especially where I'm based in uh, Melbourne, uh, Japanese language is still the dominant uh, Asian language a lot of students uh, want to learn. Uh, they've been teaching uh, Japanese for more than 100 years. And in this regard, Korea is 100 years behind Japan in terms of uh, language teaching uh, of overseas. Uh, the Confucius Institution on of, you know, the Chinese language side has been teaching the language, but it actually backfires because uh, it's uh, understood as it's driven by the CCP or uh, you know, as a, it understood as a foreign influence. Uh, from what I ex experienced as a professor teaching Korea uh, in Australia, what really uh, fascinates young people beyond K-pop and language is Korean history and contemporary social issues such as uh, gender-based uh, violence, like the anti-feminism growing and Lee Jun Suk, uh, youth suicide and unemployment issues, and North Korea and the peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so I have students approaching me also asking about, you know, what they uh, want to study about uh, comfort women issue, uh, Park jong hees uh, era's uh, economic development in the 60s, uh, and also 60s film director Iman Hee, who I've never heard of. So students' interest in, in Korean language and K-pop is really going uh, uh, beyond that sort of a beginner stage at the moment. So they want to learn about, you know, what's happening on the DMZ and the, the North Korean defector crossing the border to the north side. So this is where the next K contents need to work on from now on, in my perspective. Right, and staying with that, beyond language then, Professor, what do you believe is the next level for Korea's content makers to further boost their international standing? Uh, actually, there are many things, of course, but among others, I would like to point out two things. One thing is that now Korean culture is I mean, being enjoyed by like global audience, which, which means that in, I mean, in the past, many like Korean creators who have produced great Korean content actually thought about, the, not really thought about, did not really uh, think about the possibility that their culture will be enjoyed uh, overseas. So it means that TV series, K-pop or other like Korean TV shows, variety shows, the, uh, they, what they try to do is to satisfy the very demand from local audience, I mean the Korean audience. But now it is enjoyed by like global audience and even many like producers still do, do not really expect that their product will be enjoyed by like not only by East Asian audience, not only by American audience, but like for example audience from Central Asia, Africa, North Africa or Middle East, which has a very, which, which, which exists, th there is this uh, kind of the very cultural difference between them, right? So they now, we should think about that all Korean culture will be enjoyed by others, so what we try to do is to not only think about like what we are going to like show, but what we, I mean, I mean, what w our culture will be enjoyed by like the global audience. So the Korean culture will include all those like the consideration about the cultural differences. And the next thing is that there th we should like guarantee the artistic freedom, which means that it, it, the reason that Korean culture can be developed like this is to guarantee all those artists' freedom that pre producers try, can make what they want it to make, right? But th now there is a kind of many like sensitive issues such as political issues or the economic issues of, like gender issues, which may become a kind of big barrier for all those artistic producers to create what they really want. And it can be a kind of the obstacle also for the global audience that they love what 
Korean culture have expressed very freely what bit, what they not, may not love the culture um, produced in a very limited uh, environment. Right, so, it needs to branch yeah. out, be yeah. more diverse, and right, right. perhaps uh, address universal issues. Right, right, true. So right. we also should consider this issue as well. Right, we should. All right, Professor Yi, thank you very much for your thoughts today. Professor Song over in Australia, thank you very much for being with us. And Professor Chem Sai Tong here in the studio as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this edition of The Daily Report. Do take care. See you same time on Friday. Thank you for now.